Good afternoon in New York. Good evening in Ukraine, England, Europe, Israel, Africa. And welcome whatever time of day or night for all of you who are joining us from the, world, the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. Held on World Refugee Day, it marks the highest level of displacement on record. As I wrote here, when we prepared the flyer, a staggering 103 million individuals have been forcibly displaced worldwide. Uh, the Secretary General's uh, statement this morning says that it's 110 million individuals have been forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. 69% of those displaced across borders come from just five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Ukraine. Today's ICMGLT's webinar will concentrate primarily on children of three of these groups. Multidisciplinary experts will review child refugee and refugee experiences at various stages of the process, applying a short as well as long-term intergenerational preventive lens. This webinar would not have happened if it weren't for the generosity and dedication of ICMGLT board member, Mary, Mary uh, Fabry. I also want to acknowledge with great thanks our wonderful interpreters, Gana Stembkowska and Natalia Zetz, who are joining us from Kyiv, Ukraine. Your moderator, myself, I am a clinical psychologist, victimologist, traumatologist, and psychohistorian. Psycho by psychohistorian, I mean, uh, history as is, is lived by us. History as we, everyone, live it, lives it. I devoted much of my career to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights, to reparative justice, and indeed to articulating history as it is lived rather than as it, it, it is written about. Our first presenter, Nimad Ahmadi, is founder and president of the Four Women Action Group and the founder CEO of Unique 22 LLC Strategies. Ms. Ahmadi, is a veteran human rights and genocide prevention activist and a seasoned international NGO, sorry, is a seasoned, oh, forgive me, and a seasoned strategic planning and management professional. Having previously worked for various international NGOs in the fields of emergency relief, development and policy advocacy, she was recognized by President George Bush as a freedom fighter for human rights of her people. 
She holds an MSc in Sustainable Development and a BA in Psychology and Preschool Education from Ahfad University for Women in Sudan. Our next presenter, André Laperrier, a board member of the ICMGLT, is an expert in international development, population displacement, and hunger, with degrees in administration and industrial relations. Canadian Mr. Laperrier worked for over 18 years, mostly with the United Nations in conflict and post-conflict area on three continents with refugees and internally displaced persons, including in Eritrea, Ethiopia, Haiti, Iraq, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. He is the first executive director of the Trust Fund for Victims of the International Criminal Court. Katerina Yavna is a Ukrainian psychologist with a pre-Bologna Agreement Specialist Psychology degree from the University of Lviv, Ukraine, and accredited cognitive behavior therapy ther therapist and teacher supervisor. Katrina serves as head of the accreditation committee of the Ukrainian Association of CBT, as well as the director of publishing at the Institute of Mental Health at the Ukraine Catholic University. She is a trainer at the Children and War Foundation, United Kingdom. Last but not least, our uh, presenter Professor Dinka Korkalo Biruski is a professor of social psychology at the University of Zagreb, Croatia. Her research interest includes intergroup relations in war and peace. And Dinka, please correct me if I don't include other important credentials. She specializes especially in social reconstruction processes in war-tone communities. Uh, she is a part of several research programs that she would describe to you here on integration of ethnic minorities and the role of schools in these processes. Uh, and the rest she will describe in her presentation, which is uh, unique in the sense that it, it, it focuses on school as, as a receiving, uh, as a receiving place for the children. We have an hour and a half for the webinar. Each speaker, although we are known to run over, each speaker will talk for about eight minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with what we call last words. Uh, please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your question to a particular panelist or to the full panel. We begin with an old colleague, Nimat Ahmadi. Uh, Nimat, the screen is yours. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. Yale Daniele for bringing us together to share our wisdom with our audience today. Um, as I speak, um, I'm prepared to speak to you today. Um, Sudan is going through the most difficult time in our history. And especially after last week's um, 
situation in Algenena that shook the world conscious where people were massacred and forced to flee their homeland, escorted out by outsiders who have taken their land. So um, it's hard to see, but um, I always try to find hope. Speaking about the intergenerational legacies of trauma, uh, based on my experience, I've been through three generations of uh, people who grow up or live through the um, crisis and they lived in many different places or refugees. As the conflict in South Sudan, between Sudan and South Sudan was heading into a solution um, when the comprehensive peace agreement was negotiated Unfortunately, the government of Sudan launched the attack on Darfur. So before Southern Sudanese can return home, Darfur is start fleeing. Um, these are the same people from one country. And unfortunately, South Sudan is not currently um, part of Sudan, but that's the reality of how conflict um, create new realities. And that also another form of trauma that people who grow up knowing themselves as Southern Sudan, as Sudanese, now they're confined into being Southern Sudanese. And someone like myself is, needs a visa to go to that country. So when people fled, first people go to many different countries and many different communities, even within the same country, sometimes there is different in culture. There is competition over resources and there is a uh, lack of like, you know, um, interest from the host community because of realities that sometimes the host communities themselves sharing very scarce resources. We have people who were forced to flee across, across the border to Chad and we have people who cross the border to South Sudan, people who fled to Egypt. And for adult people face all kinds of disparities and indifferences by uh, the host community. In some places they feel home and in other places they always feel outsiders even after decades um, that they spent in these countries. Uh, for instance, um, people who fled to Chad or Uganda they are welcomed and they felt uh, that they can finally find home away from home. Unfortunately, like people who fled to Egypt and Jordan, even though uh, Sudanese speak Arabic, but they were perceived as outsiders and they are not relevant in this society. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are subjected to insult and racial slurs and all kind of um, maltreatment by the host community. And we understand that sometimes the host community are under stress of limited resources, but this is very present as people living in, and in, in, in they're the adults trying to understand and to overcome and deal with their trauma that we are here only temporary. We are here, we may be resettled into some way that is better, that is welcoming. And that's the hope for thousands or hundreds of thousands of refugees, unfortunately, uh, resettlement happen only to about 1% of the total number of whatever refugees living in that area. And so the remaining will remain there. Sometimes they don't see hope. Children grow up in a place that they were told they were never belong here. And they start like having this conversation with their parents that they better I have seen in an instance children telling their parents that it's better for us to go to stay home and get killed. Why you bring us here? Like they're blaming their parents because um, they, they felt they are not welcome. For example, there is no schools for Sudanese refugees in Egypt. So they have the refugees themselves, they have to create their own schools, which are not like really set in a foundation that can help uh, they then receive quality education or either deal with the trauma. There is no spaces or child-friendly spaces. People will, will have a small place for students. They go to the school and they get out when the class is over. They don't have place to play or, 
or have talent development activities or recreational activities. So kids are confined and then they are not in a camp where they can feel the sense of community. Like in, in, in Chad, people, when they come together, they feel a sense of community. So they are sitting around the fireplace, listening to stories of the older um, uh, female members of their society, telling them they're trying to make sure that these children hold on to their culture. But this is not the case in places where like people, when they go, they have to fend for themselves, find a place to live, find a work to, to earn income and find a school for their children. Kids go to high school, they finish high school, graduate, and they don't have any place to go because um, refugees are not accepted in Egyptian uh, universities unless they can afford to pay for it. And uh, similarly in Jordan, on in other areas. Um, while in Uganda, the refugees are welcome, not refugees just from Sudan, but also from different countries, including previously refugees from Rwanda, refugees from South Sudan, Ethiopia, the Congo. And they go to school just like the Ugandan children, and they go to high school and go to college, and they can even have their master's degree. So the experience of each generation is different, mm -hmm. but it's still, uh, you see sometimes um, parents try their best not to, to overcome, but this need, the intergenerational trauma need more than just the parents themselves because the parents do not know better. They have the turmoil of their own. They have their harsh, harsh experiences. So sometimes um, they, they end up not knowing how to overcome that. And there is an experience that I have witnessed, even for those who stayed home. When I went back to Sudan in 2021, after 16 years, um, I found there is a huge gap between the young people. These are the people that I love them. They were two, they were three when they brought into the camps. They grow up and they now, they feel, uh, they felt that their parents and the elderly in the community, they stuck in the past. That these are, these people, are just this generation representing uh, the old Sudan, and they are they are going to move toward the new Sudan. But then their parents said, like, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you are going. You need to understand why you are here. You need to understand your family's plight, your tribe's plight, your struggle, so that you can fight for your right. Because people felt the genocide that started 20 years ago, it has not been resolved. The attackers have yet to be apprehended or held accountable. So the parents have all the reason but children don't understand. They are tired of just being told uh, over and over again the stories of horror. So they want to see something positive. So um, to end this, I'm trying to, to be brief. Uh, so um, I see also stories of hope. I saw the stories of taromas that being like transfer, but I also saw stories of hope. So I uh, would quote uh, Dr. Mark, Mark Luther King, Juniors, as said, uh, out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And I have seen that hope. Like uh, in my experience also working with my uh, close friend and partners in Kurdistan, uh, there is this um, young uh, son of my friend who grew up knowing very well the struggle of the Kurdish people and the situation that his, his parents were uh, refugees, they were exiled. They live in the Netherlands, but they in an education. Once after the fall of Saddam Hussein, they came back and they were so eager to rebuild their society. So his father went into the government, but his mom went into a civil, being a civil society and created an organization that can help the survivors overcome and working with the affected communities, including lately we start working with the Yazidi communities after ISIS attack. Mm -hmm. And another story of South Southern Sudanese who lived in, in refugee camp in Uganda. So this boy have become so attached and tried to, um, to turn that trauma that he inherited from his parents because he also saw the positive contribution of his parents into the society. But this is a very few example. Not everyone will get this opportunity, but I see that like we can also learn from how to direct and guide children and how to create an enabling environment for he's he believed in the cause and instead of stuck in and getting sad and angry he decided to study law and he 
also get interested because he considered me like his godmother. <laughs> and he was so connected to the situation in Darfur because of the, the similarity in the plight of the people of Darfur. So he believed in that accountability, it will be a deterrent. And that he, instead of asking other people to do, he will be, right now he just finished his master. Uh, he'll be graduating in July. And he is hoping to work to improve international institutions so that international community can be um, serious in pursuing justice. Another this um, young uh, man from South Sudan was sitting in your in um, Yida camp and uh, telling his mom that he wants a computer. And his mom was like, what? I am struggling to feed you. How could I afford a computer? And this boy insisted again and again that he wanted a computer. So his mom felt there must be something important for his. She worked really hard and saved up for a year and she was finally able to get a used computer for him. Guess what? Using that computer playing game out of that calm, going sometimes to mm -hmm. internet cafes, he <clears throat> created a game and and name it after his South Sudanese um, name, like a Junoop game, something. I, I don't recall it the exact game. And finally, he received an extra uh, um, a visa that given for a person with extraordinary abilities to come to DC. And he is here in the United States working okay. with so many tech companies um, promoting his game. His game. So to close on that, I think. We all need to work together, the school, the parents, the NGOs who are working, the host communities, and also government of those countries where the host, where, where refugees flee, they need to uphold obligation to the law to create an enabling environment for people to have new life, have education, so that they can be able to overcome their traumas. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, 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 and humbly, I might add that Neymat herself came here as barely a girl. Uh, and she is an example for all of us as well. Uh, thank you very much, Neymat, for underscoring so many of the key, uh, key dimensions that we must uh, address in this very important panel. Andre, would you uh, would you please take the screen? I believe you even have a sh screen sharing. Yes, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, as you will see in this brief presentation, I tried to take uh, bits and pieces of um, the experience I had the chance to to go through during my my career, in particular in during my time in conflict environments but uh, also my time at the court uh, etc so i'll start with the with the screen just uh, right away wonderful okay and then i'll maybe... oh, i see you took the the our concept of supporting structures yes thank you wonderful mm -hmm. yes because indeed uh, talking about overcoming trauma is uh, is not just a theory. It it it, it requires some very technical um, elements, uh, which themselves need need support. So I'm going to say a few words about those. Um, yeah. Well, just uh, the first word we made a reference to it, but it's important that people visualize that there are two categories of displaced people: there are those that are displaced within their country and sometimes very big country, whether it is Ukraine or DRC or other places. And then there are refugees, or those that are classified as refugees, so that move across borders from one country to the next. The distinction is important in particular because um, uh, IDPs, internationally displaced, because they don't, they're not categorized as refugees, they don't have access to some of the resources made available uh, to refugees specifically, like what does, for instance, the UN Agency for, uh, for Refugees, which does not have access to uh, or jurisdiction over IDPs. Um, why do people move? Well, they move essentially because of three causes, because of war, because of hunger, difficult economic situations, misery, or because of climate change and its consequences, whether it is in terms of uh, ocean rising 
or agriculture being uh, becoming impossible by lack of water or excess heat, which in turn leads to hunger and then to people having to move. Uh, in these groups, uh, what we've noticed, and I've noticed that uh, all over the world, really, that those most affected tend to be women and children. Mm. Why is it always women and children? Well, it's because they're often left on their own, as the husband is oftentimes somewhere else working or somewhere else fighting if, if there's a war. Maybe he's dead already. Uh, second, because there's a lack of access to resources for women uh, around the world, especially uh, resources like technology, mobile phones, internet, uh, things that maybe could help them improve their economic situation. Uh, and then, of course, the children, because they are totally dependent on their parents and mostly on their mother, uh, they're the ones most affected uh, as well. Um, when you talk yeah. about... Sorry? When you, when you talk about overcoming trauma, you um, you don't take care of trauma just by charity. Charity does not really help overcome trauma. Empowerment does. You know, you can, what you want to do is you want people to regain the strength to become active again in society and the family and be able to carry out the, their normal task. So um, this requires empowerment and empowering the parents is very important because that's the key to empowering the children. So both are very much linked. Uh, together. Um, just a couple of statistics. By 2030, uh, we're evaluating that 80% of the world's extreme poor, I'll show you where they are, they live in the world's most dangerous places. Dangerous because of poverty, because of climate change, famine, or conflict in particular. So 80% of the world's extreme poor, so those that are already most vulnerable and most susceptible of having to move from being forced to move at one point or another. Uh, this graph shows uh, which ones are these most dangerous countries. And the darkest ones, of course, are the, considered as the, uh, the most dangerous and the lighter color, less dangerous. So you, you can see this is mostly, we're talking mostly of Africa, uh, part of Asia, uh, Mexico, Venezuela, so mm -hmm. mostly these countries. Um, People are forced to move also because of climate change. Uh, I refer to the, the rise of the oceans, which is flooding an increasing number of villages and, and small islands in particular, uh, where people have to be uh, removed uh, because they're, they're going underwater. An extreme weather event is a tornado, hurricane, a big drought, uh, forest fires, uh, extreme heat events. What this shows, it, it reads from left to right, and going down from up, down. But the, the key figures are on the left-hand side. In 1955, it was estimated that about 1% of the Earth was subject to extreme weather events. In 2021, it was already 25%. Now we're heading towards 30%. So more and more places around the world are affected. So more and more places are susceptible of generating more refugees, this time because of climate change. Um, so, I mean, it's the impact of climate change on the populations is very important. Um, this graph, what this graph shows, unfortunately, it only goes to 2017. That is, it stops just before the pandemic, which exacerbated this phenomenon, which was that as we had been doing very well with the SDGs, the, uh, the UN goals to decrease uh, hunger, the goal was to decrease hunger by, by half. Uh, unfortunately, um, as we speak now, we have basically lost all the progress that we had done since 2005. Uh, in 2017, hunger had gone back up from 780 million to 820, and now we're around 900 million again, which again is likely to trigger more people moving. So worldwide, there's about 36, these are 2021 figures. So numbers have increased ever since. But in 2021, we already had 36 million children, I'm focusing on children here, that have been displaced because of conflict and violence. Uh, in addition, um, uh, there was 2.4 million more that were uh, that had to move as a consequence of natural disaster. And now, we have 5 million more refugees or displaced people uh, because of the war in Ukraine. 
So as you see, these figures are quite important. A large number of children that need care. And yet the numbers seem to be uh, increasing. Supporting structures. So what are people doing about this? And what kind of setup do we have to help? Well, essentially four groups uh, are providing these structures that play a very important role in overcoming trauma. One, government institutions, they do all kinds of programs, language training, social education, professional and, and trade recognition. I'll come back to that last, last point. The UN and other international institutions, they do mental and physical health, basic necessities, shelter, private companies. On the refugee day, we were pleased to, uh, to see the announcement that in Europe, 300 major European companies have just pledged now, this is breaking news, hiring 250,000 refugees in the coming year. So sorry for the typo. And finally, a, a concentration of compatriots because of family ties, cultural bonds, mm. and help is really helpful to help people reintegrate or resume a more normal life because then they can link up with people that speak the same language, have maybe the same religion, the same food, the same way to live. So it's one step towards normality. Now, concretely, what that does, what these people do, physical rehabilitation, plastic surgery, prosthesis, uh, orthopedic surgery, fun children as well. These are, this is Evelyn. She was a, a war child in Uganda. Uh, they, they do prosthesis. They do uh, interfaith. Uh, is, is, um, I'm not sure what the word is, but what you see people there are people from uh, uh, eight different religions, and that's in Uganda, that decided to work together through their faiths in uh, seeking resolution, uh, sorry, uh, seeking uh, forgiveness, um, peace, and return to normality and helping each other. Uh, across religions. Um, psychotherapy session, like this young uh, girl is, is having one right now. Counselors training. So the numbers are so big that you, you need a lot of counselors to, to help. And uh, so some countries are taking that very seriously and organizing all kinds of trainings. Reconciliation initiatives. So we all know the, the good efforts done in uh, South Africa. This one is in uh, Northern Uganda, where the uh, the perpetrators of the the crimes uh, ask for forgiveness. So they're the ones who go on the stage, explain what they have done to the crowd, and ask for forgiveness. So which which contributes to a collective overcoming of the trauma. And then the communities are being helped also to take the situation in their own hands, not not so much by charity, but by hard work. And this is what this group is doing: restoring an, a road that had been totally abandoned during the the war that leads to their village called Apungi, which today is uh, fully restored. Um, as you see, maize and all kinds of plantations have been restored. But what is most interesting is that before this effort started, the children were just destitute, basically. So there was uh, very little, if any, hope for them. Well, now, uh, thanks to the road and to the different initiatives uh, that the mothers and others took, now they can afford the uh, school uniforms. That's why they're all in blue there and going to school. Canada, we have an ambitious policy on, on immigration and refugees. Uh, as you may know, about a quarter of the Canadian population is not, was not born here. So in, immigrants play a very important role in the economy, sorry, and um, in, the, in the country's future, because the, otherwise the, the Canada's population is going to reduce over time. So to overcome that, uh, during the first 10 months of 2022, uh, 645,000 temporary work permits for foreigners were issued. That was four times uh, the number issued the year before. And now the plan for the government is to welcome 500,000 immigrants every year, out of which 20% should be refugees. Now, there's, it's nice to have big goals like this. Uh, we've had big goals in trying to uh, host refugees for many years, but we sell them reach uh, our target goals. And why is that? It's because there are a number of uh, obstacles to that. First, financial, of course, you, you need the right infrastructure to receive uh, the refugees. So that takes a bit of money. But the main problems in Canada are others. There are things like remoteness, 
refugees tend to um, not to want to go too far from their their home country by hope that maybe someday they'll be able to go back. So having to cross the Atlantic and go as far as Canada is, seems insurmountable to many. Climate, some people uh, overestimate or overrate maybe uh, Canada's winter. So uh, that is also um, an obstacle. Language can be, we're, we're a bilingual country. So uh, depending where you go, you may have to learn French or English, which may not, neither may be your natural, your mother tongue. So uh, then there's a problem for, not just for Canada, many countries have that in its professional recognition, the equivalence equivalent of diplomas, degrees, so if you're a doctor in uh, in Ukraine and you move to Canada, it's not automatic that you'd be recognized as a doctor here. So they're trying to work equivalency to make these transitions uh, easier, but it's a very complex situation. And finally, we're trying to speed up the time required for processing. Uh, we still have uh, refugees from Afghanistan that are still waiting to come in. So uh, the government right now is overhauling the, the whole system to make that faster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. And uh, thank you for uh, for covering the world and Canada all in a brief uh, <laughs> all in a brief presentation. Uh, it uh, I said before that this webinar would not have happened without Mary Fabry. What I have not mentioned, who I have not mentioned yet, uh, is uh, Irina, Irina Frankova and Oris Tsuvalo, who uh, help not only in bringing, uh, Irina is on the advisory council of ICMGLT, and, and she and Oris are on our working group on Ukraine. Uh, they both helped find a wonderful interpreters and our next speaker, <laughs> Katerina. Uh, the screen is yours. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Dr. Daniel. You know, would you speak up? Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for invitation. Thank you, Oris and Irena, for recommendation. And um, I'm honored to be with you today and to make a small presentation about project that I supervised in Ukraine. And uh, this project is um, providing uh, help to the children age 8, 18, by using um, five uh, sessions training called teaching recovery techniques that was recommended and um, established by Children and War Foundations many years ago. And then uh, in a cooperation with uh, UNICEF and uh, Ukrainian chat center called Volunteers with support with Ukrainian Institute of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, uh, we trained 17 trainers of the program. Uh, we did it in March 2022. And um, the program called Teaching Recovery Techniques. And it's a five session training that help children to learn the skills that would help them to deal with the stress, with intrusions, avoidance, and arousals as a symptoms of stress reaction or PTSD. Um, we also translate the manual and um, uh, it's um, uh, free to download in Ukrainian language uh, from internet. Um, over in that project, uh, because there is many projects in Ukraine that use a TRT uh, training, but in this project, we train 424 team leaders or facilitators who in pair can run the group with the children um, age 8 and 18. As you see, it's spread all over Ukraine and even abroad. Um, uh, in 
timeframe in this project, uh, we held 746 group and 40% of those groups was online and 52% of the group were uh, face to face. Uh, it's covered all together 6,500 uh, 6, participants, uh, some in Ukraine and some abroad. Abroad groups was mainly done by online training. It means that children connect to uh, the uh, Zoom platform and then come uh, online for one and a half hour training and meet other friend, our ch other children and practice the techniques uh, with two facilitators in each group. Uh, it's the, we have a permission to show you these pictures from face to face group uh, in Ukraine. And I, as you see, it's very friendly and children love it. And the usual uh, problem for facilitator was that children ask for one more group meetings. Could we have one more training uh, day and just stay together? I think it's very important what uh, Neymar and other colleagues uh, mentioned, how important it is for internally di displaced or refugees people to still have something within their communities, you know? And I think one of the benefit of this group, uh, especially for um, children who went abroad was to be connected with their uh, friends um, online who stay in Ukraine. This group was really friendly and uh, pleasant atmosphere for them. Some pictures from the children and um, this video is in Ukrainian that uh, I, I can't show you now. And what we adjust, uh, what was the adjustment to the training? It's we were very flexible on time. We, we could change time of the group that would be convenient for different time zone or for different issues in Ukraine or abroad. We also support the groups via uh, different social networks like Telegram. We send them messages. We um, put children together on the group that they can continue communicate and even still contact their facilitators. And our face-to-face -face groups has uh, a possibility to get some uh, hands handouts or have it time for coffee or cakes with other children. Um, we asked children about feedback in the end. Was it useful for you to be on that group? Or did you learn anything useful? And we was very pleased to uh, children's um, uh, replies because almost more than 80% said yes. And 10% said it's almost it's almost 90 it's, it's almost 90, 90 thank you <laughs> no, <laughs> yes uh, and um, you know it's it, it first we was very pleased the children give us answers you know it's quite difficult to have a feedback from children especially it mostly been done online and we was really pleased to hear that they love and uh, benefit from these programs um if we also use the Christ questionnaire is an event impact scale, um, you know, and we measure intrusion and avoidance before and after groups. And we were pleased to recognize that the symptoms of intrusions and avoidance come down after group. And uh, what was the challenges? You know, is, is this quite a challenge to keep attention on online groups, uh, especially after two years of COVID, you know, and online schools. Um, the class attendance variable because sometimes, because it's still ongoing conflict and, you know, last year we have a lot of problems with electricity and internet mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult to launch the same group on the same time, on the same um, uh, internet and uh, electricity availability. Yes, uh, sometimes motivations drop, you know, because it was difficult for children still uh, uh, 
be on a war conflict, uh, on a war zone, you know, and talk about it. Or sometimes they want to avoid talk about what's going on to them. And um, that we put a lot of efforts to keep them motivated to attend and learn some skills. And um, it also was difficult because more children register for the group than attend the groups, you know, and then it was some organizations issues. Same with webinars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Daniel. Yes. Um, but, but still, it's just an obstacle. It was not what... Uh, um, uh, it's just something that you should think to deal with when you plan to do that. You know, it's more like we want to share what we met. Then future plans is keep going. And I know that we now plan a new project. Um, just today was a short discussions, how we still can support children in Ukraine and out of the Ukraine to help them to deal with their trauma and uh, uh, stress symptoms. Uh, because as all of you mentioned, you know, there is a lot of good stories that children share on the groups and that really helpful and uh, supportive to those who are still uh, on the difficult situations or experience um, more war um, uh, conf conflicts. Um, uh, influence in their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you see how rich uh, each each presentation is, and how they embroider each other <laughs> into into the tapestry of this amazing webinar. Mm -hmm. So before I I uh, leave, give the screen to to uh, to Dinka, an old friend. Uh, and colleague, I want to acknowledge indeed that it was ICMGLT board member Dina Djukovic <laughs> who said, oh, yes, we are doing a, a, a webinar on refugee children. I have the right person and you know her. So thank you again, Dean. <laughs> and uh, Dinka, please uh, teach us. Thank you so much, Yael, and thank you for your kind invitation. It's a really privilege to be with you uh, tonight. It's a night in Europe or evening, and uh, to talk about these important uh, issues, really. So let me try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, Okay, are we all set? Okay, in my brief talk, uh, I would like to bring our attention to the supporting structure that uh, was mentioned quite a few times during the past presentations, and this is school and schooling of refugee children. So let me start with some data. Uh, according to uh, UNHCR data, about 8 million children are refugee children of school age. And these data are a bit old from 2020. And because of the Ukraine war, the numbers are probably much higher today, unfortunately. So in spite of the fact that many international declarations and documents identify education as a critical element of the international refugee response. For many refugee children, the access to education is highly limited, as Nimat uh, said to us before, and for almost half of them, it's not possible to attend uh, schools at all. Uh, moreover, a recent joint report of UNESCO and UNHCR concludes that education is often not a priority intervention in refugee response, and certainly it should be. So why schools? Why they are so important? First of all, to begin with, education is a basic human right. School is not only about gaining information. It's also where children learn how to interact with others, how to make friendships, 
how to learn about social norms, particularly norms of solidarity, of social mm -hmm. inclusion, of contact, of how to contact with members with other groups. And in these settings, teachers are extremely important role models who can encourage and support children in their social interactions. Moreover, for refugee children who often experience multiple trauma before arriving to safety, school provides secure and stable environment, giving the children a break from adversities and the chance to recover and to rebuild their lives. So having in mind all these important aspects of schooling in the lives of all children, including refugee children, of course, we developed a project supported by the joint program scheme of creation and Swiss Science Foundation, uh, calling integrating refugee children in school, a mixed method study on the efficacy of contact in school interventions for building positive intergroup relations among refugee and host society children. At this point, maybe it's important to uh, say that Croatia is a relatively new receiving country. So our, uh, let's say, policies of integrating refugees uh, uh, were not well established before, let's say, 2015. Uh, so the main goal of our project was to promote and facilitate the integration of refugee children in elementary schools in Croatia by overcoming the challenges of integration and encouraging understanding and tolerance through positive intergroup contact because we know that refugees are faced with a lot of prejudice, with a lot of stereotyping and so on and so on, as we hear before as well. So in developing the project, we followed what we call bottom-up approach and first explore the needs and challenges in the school integration process. And we did a series of focus groups and interviews with refugee children, their parents, domicile peers, teachers, school pedagogues, psychologists, et cetera, et cetera. And more of results you can see in the public in our recent uh, publication in Journal of Qualitative Study in Education. Uh, from our discussions with different actors in the process of integration, we identified basically two major and different obstacles in schools with different integration experiences. So in schools with refugee children already being enrolled, we identified the language proficiency as the major obstacle for integration. So simply said, children are not proficient in Croatian language, period, right? So we decided to develop the integration program based on direct contact of domicile and refugee children through nonverbal activities. So nobody actually needs the language, the use of language in a series of cooperative learning activities. So all the children can participate fully and on equal footing, no matter if they are proficient in Croatian language or not. For schools where refugees are not yet in, uh, enrolled, but they will be certainly, we developed a program we called preparation for integration. So it was aid for domicile children. In those schools, the major obstacle was the fact that children really were not clear who refugees are, what kind of challenges they may expect in interacting with them, which of course may cause anxiety on the part of domiciled children. So we decided to develop a program based on what we call imagined contact, because many studies show, have shown that even only imagining positive contact with a member of other group could actually improve both our expectations of contact and our uh, attitudes and behaviors toward uh, uh, those groups. So our integration program based on cooperative learning is based on well-known contact hypotheses, assuming that positive intergroup contact is the most important factor in developing mutually positive intergroup uh, attitudes. Therefore, we developed a series of activities where students need to cooperate in small groups composed of 
domicile children and at least one refugee child. So everybody actually are in contact. So they have mutual goal to complete. For example, to build a tower from plastic glasses, to learn a few sentences in Croatian sign language, to assemble a tangram or to come up with a synchronized rhythm or, or a dance uh, on a popular uh, song. So um, uh, in completing the activities, they need to cooperate. They have a mutual goal. Each and every group member is important and necessary to complete the task. And of course, everything is done uh, by the guidance, very thoughtful guidance and support for the teachers. Uh, what is important for school settings is that each activity can be completed in one school hour. And most importantly, all activities are nonverbal, requiring a minimum of verbal instructions or no verbal instructions uh, at all. Uh, uh, in our imagined contact activities, they are also conducted in a class by first introducing the concept of refugees and then a teacher led the children to imagine positive contact with their refugee peers through different scenarios describing interaction in school, in a park, in different helping situation, or in participating simply in sport activities. And these are also techniques for enhancing, and there are also techniques for enhancing the effect of imagining contact individually and uh, in the group. As for program outcomes, we may say that, uh, say that all activities are really fun, enjoyable, and students and teachers participate with great pleasure. Both types of activities proved successful in improving various intergroup outcomes, which is important. Imagined contact activities, it's important, work slightly better with younger children. So they are more appropriate for lower grades of elementary schools, but they function well for uh, elderly as well, or older children as well. And cooperative learning activities are particularly effective in improving children's perception of teachers' norms regarding intergroup contact, proving again how teachers are important in developing a positive classroom climate and friendly intergroup relations. Uh, among children. And at the end, uh, here you have a link with the manual uh, or, or handbook for the implementation of cooperative learning uh, and imagined contact workshops. And here are our contacts. So feel free to download the menu, uh, to, uh, manual to use the activities, to implement them in schools. And uh, if you want to share um, your uh, information with us, your implementations or your examples of implementations or have any questions, feel, feel, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if we can uh, free the screen so we come back to to our wonderful uh, wow i said that uh, uh the second phase of our webinar is you having a dialogue among yourself a multi-dialogue and uh, any questions to each other but before we open that please the library of the ICMGLT is the richest library and resources on multi-generational legacies of trauma in the world and the more up-to-date and world-class. Any, any reference you see missing there of your own work or work that you deem relevant, please send us so it further enriches our library, because just as Dinka invited you to use that, we aim to be the resource, uh, an educational resource too. And uh, it's an honor to each one of you. Uh, you know, many professors around the world now assign their classes our webinars and assign papers for students to to uh, to write, et cetera, and get involved, uh, both in humanitarian work, but in knowing the, what's happening 
etc. So yes, yes, so uh, we are truly an educational resource and each one of you can, pro can contribute not only in this amazing webinar, but in the future as well. And perhaps we should create a working group on children. We have not done that. Uh, so, but part of what happens, uh, we sort of develop future webinars based on the issues that emerge in our dialogues, which is the most authentic way of learning. Uh, so uh, please, uh, I mind you, any question to each other, any comment to each other? If I may start, <laughs> <laughs> my question goes to Katerina. It's an amazing program. What, wait, uh, I'm, I'm not hearing you. Migration? My question goes to Katerina. It is amazing program. Uh, I can only imagine how hard it was to conduct, to invent it, to conduct, to uh, get the children involved and so on and so on. So my question is, how did you succeed in recruiting children to participate? Mm. Thank you, Professor Denka. It's very nice what you're saying. Um, what we did is a lot of social media information about group. You know, we tried to reach the children. Mm -hmm. uh, the second difference was that we, um, children themselves could uh, put them on the list. You know, it does not need uh, support from adult to do that. And I think that sad um, um, tips uh, for recruiting was we contacted teachers we let teachers know about this program and some of the facilitators were teachers you know and they um, invite children from school to join the groups yeah and we had a wonderful team you know i think that the first thing is people you know we had a lovely <laughs> A team of uh, this uh, and it, this is non-government organizations called volunteer, and they did amazing job. Uh, well, it is proved again if you are able to get teachers being involved, then everything yes. is possible. <laughs> oh yes, no, no, we definitely uh, use the same to as you to reach the children is yeah. to connect to teachers. Yeah. And teachers are wonderful, you know, they saw, they recognized that during the war time, uh, children need a psychological support. And by taught them those five sessions, they feel more empowered to help children at school, you know, not just in math and language, but also how to deal with intrusions, how to do relaxation. I think everybody in Ukraine now know how to breathe in and breathe out properly. Mm. <laughs> but let us not forget that as much that children need support, teachers need support as well. Because, because we their job in wartime is extremely important and mm. extremely difficult. And I even tell you more, we also had the program for teachers, six yes. sessions with teachers uh, yes. for themselves. You know, and it's interesting what you say, because the problem with teachers that we recognized was that they were that they usually on their training group starts asking how we should use it with children. And we were saying, no, no, it's for you. It's you should use it for yourself. And they said, yeah. you know, taught us how to use it for children. It was very difficult for them to start thinking about themselves, but we recognize that and had also program for teachers. And, and if we take that onward, of course, psychotherapists, humanitarian aid workers, all, all people who are confronted with the situation. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, you're absolutely correct. And as I told you earlier before, I, you, you remind me in this discussion of my mother, let her soul rest in peace. She's probably smiling up there because when she raised me up, she used to come, she was a teacher. She used to come back, a teacher at the beginning of the State of Israel. So we had right after the whole class, many of her students were refugee children. And, and she would come home and say, today I learned three words in Hungarian. Or she would say, and she would teach us. So, so she would uh, she would infuse in us the the pride of of learning from the children, not only teaching the children. Mm -hmm. And and I remember many of her students loved her because she made them feel useful and contributory. Uh, so. Um, Keep going, uh, Nimat. I can see that your your eyes are shining with with something to say. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, just going to say. Also, uh, we don't we have to remember parents because uh, sometimes, like the children parents relationship is very important. While mm -hmm. they uh, bottle their own trauma, they also wanted to create an enabling environment for children, and sometimes. Uh, they need resources uh, like guidance and directions uh, towards, mm -hmm. especially like uh, getting adjusted to a new environment and dealing with children and also meeting the need for the children. Sometimes children's uh, like development proceed their parents' capacity and things like that. And I've seen uh, sometimes like even here in the United States, like when uh, people come from war situation, mostly there is no option for mental health or trauma counseling or anything. And then people try just to put the smile on, start working and running around. And then they may end up like having this huge gap between them and their children because children are going to a different school system than the school system that the mother went to, mm -hmm. the language barrier and all of those. So I think like uh, just uh, giving special consideration to uh, communities coming from war zones uh, is particularly important, and I know it's like it's hard sometimes to provide counseling for each individual. But I found that group counseling is something that is like really important. And then also storytelling. Uh, we, what we did in our community is that like I came here. Like most people who came in 2003 were came before me, and like mostly. I'm lucky enough to come when I was like educated, I speak the language. So I was it was easy for me to integrate myself and like get me a good job and everything. But I will travel around and I speak to our community. So that was like, it also like, it's a way for me to overcome my own trauma is by get up and do something, get up and do something. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. and that helped me a lot. Um, growing up, um, I have the value that we shared of like being of help to one another. So I was so demoralized when I had to flee um, after the danger involved my life, my own life. But I felt like um, I let down my parents, my family, my mm -hmm. community, because I'm not an exception. So to overcome that, I have to do everything possible to help and be their voice and everything. And then I, I then look around and I saw the community and how overwhelmed are, how sometimes they feel isolated and they also like trying to divide themselves between coping up with the situation here while also stay connected to the family. So we promoted the storytelling and we will go gather, talk about issues back home and then have people telling, because we all like people end up running for their life. Nobody sat down to share their story with the person next to them. Right. Like I loved many of my family members don't know how the risk involved my Person, they know everything happening to the community, but like individually, how I was singled out and targeted. So things like that, you don't even have time to tell. But then I realized, like telling in telling my own story, uh, it helped me to heal. It helped me to overcome and see through like the different side of like a place where I stepped into and I felt that I can heal. And then I tried to share that with other people and encouraging people. To, to share, like just to share their stories and also having children sharing their mm -hmm. stories. It's very interesting to see 
uh, you tell them to tell, because sometimes also children try to, to detach themselves from the trauma and from the bad, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, memories and try just to deal with something that is positive. But I feel it is important for them to talk about it and to rationalize it and like walk through it and step into the next side. Otherwise that will, it might be suppressed for now, but it may come back again. Uh, and we have seen uh, some people who grown into being adult and then they were like, had the setback of having mental health issues and stuff like that. Uh, so I think it is like uh, promoting storytelling among the communities where they're creating a safe space for everyone. Uh, we did create it, uh, something called Women Empowering Women uh, for women in the DC area. Uh, when I came, I was doing advocacy, mostly like speaking to international community. I want people to do something. But then I realized that like, women who come here, they're very isolated because of the language barriers and the economic and other um, like um, disenfranchisement aspects of the society. So we promote, created this group that also tailored to the time, the flex, like it's a very flexible time, like program. This is like voluntary group that we created and grown into a project where uh, we bring women from Sudan and other African countries and including like women from Southeast Asia, from Burma and uh, other countries. And then having them talking through their issues. There are some of them that are active like myself who are helping back home, but also we are talking about what are you doing to help yourself here and what we can do. So creating that safe environment has really helped the community to be able just to feel safe, but also the, the, the sessions happen on a weekend because uh, this group that refugees, they can't afford to send their children to after school programs. So they would do it on the weekend so that the fathers can stay home with the kids so that the mother can have more time to engage in the program and in the group. And it was very interesting, like the, something that I really want to see replicated. So um, I think, yeah, yeah, thank you for bringing us back to reality uh, outside of school too. Uh, because while, it, and it's very interesting, I was thinking while you, Katerina and Inka so brilliantly presented your programs, uh, and two, I, I was feeling, what about the parents? After all, the children go back home. Uh, and uh, the parents uh, who they raise, you know, raise them and within their communities, et cetera. And I was reminded that the, re the original reason for having this webinar was in one of our other webinars where uh, Julia Richter, who is a psychologist from Hungary, uh, who, t who ha has been treating children, Ukrainian children and all others through all these years in Hungary, uh, uh, brought up, you know, the focus on what she she the way she put it was very smart, because my point was always with refugees. Uh, well, no, let me go back. Uh, and that's part of answering Aviva Pinsky's question uh, uh, in, in the, in the, among the questions. She said, will someone discuss the trauma in first and second generation, especially when parents refuse to talk about what happened? So first of all, Aviva, many of our webinars do exactly that, so please, listen to them. I I go back to listen to them because they always teach me something because when you're in a webinar, you can't really absorb all this brilliant richness. <laughs> you know, so it's like you, I go back. So I suggest strongly that you do. Also my own studies, we have, I had my own webinar that somebody interviewed me uh, that is totally de dedicated precisely to that. But uh, so please, everybody, you're more than welcome. But at the time, and the reason um, uh, 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 
Julia is not here today. Is they're having on refugee day, they're having the closing of the program event right now in Hungary. But she is the one who spoke about the children. And my comment to her was, oh, she said, why not use the children to bring the parents in? Which is a brilliant idea. How many of the programs in your schools uh, invite the parents? Because uh, it's it, granted, they, these are brilliant, but it's so much easier to control the environment you propose in a structured school. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And I'm thinking it's true for religious leaders too, right? In terms of a community center uh, and other such structures or supportive structures as Andre referred to them. How, how do we bring the parents in? Because most of the studies are devoted to intergenerational transmission of trauma are from the parents to the children. Yeah. Okay, and then to their children, if we do not uh, prevent, if we do not do something to mitigate the pathogenic processes. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And you have one minute because we have other questions. We have such a busy audience, my God. Andre, do you want to jump in for just one? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but all of you, please, one minute on these issues. And we go to the audience. They've been extremely patient. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was, I was still uh, thinking about the supporting structures because, of course, children need some sense of security, some sense Absolutely. that there's a base somewhere, which normally they find with their parents, they find in the school. So because these are permanent landmarks in their mind in a normal situation, but of course, when there's a war or uh, these are not normal circumstances so supporting structures need to be uh, adjusted in many ways uh, so it's so it's a very complex situation but one that we didn't mention uh, i thought about it thinking of my experience with child soldiers uh, mm -hmm. you know there's been thousands and thousands of them uh, especially in northern uganda sudan etc these children have been very traumatized. They've been uh, forced to do things that maybe will haunt them all their life. So they also would like to get back to some normality, but they have a double problem. One, dealing with their own nightmares, so to speak, but also the fact that they are oftentimes rejected by the community themselves mm. because they fear them. So even their own parents, I've seen uh, cases like that where parents, they would, they would lock their room at night by, by fear that the, the child will come and kill them during the night. And some did. And some did, yes. So, th so this is why the uh, I showed this slide with this uh, national reconciliation effort they did in Uganda. But uh, we have similar discussions in other countries currently in Rwanda, for example. Uh, so th that's just one more angle to the... Uh, the complexity of the refugee situation I wanted to bring in. Uh, just one sentence quick about the, uh, how your programs can, uh, can uh, contain, can include outreach to parents and in, engage the parents in the healing also of themselves. Mm. Yeah, our problem Oh, sorry, Dinka. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, our problem includes two sessions with parents, but um, it was very poor attendance. And usually uh, because parents was busy, you know, uh, during the difficult time, they more value their work than before. And um, it's difficult for them to risk their work and come for one 90 minutes online meeting about psychology you know but i think uh, we share more and more information with parents how important their role for children yes is and i think we now see more parents being involved uh, in all sorts of trainings and uh, activities uh, for preventing children trauma. Dinka? Mm. 
uh, let me abroad the picture a bit uh, by trying to, by, well, let's say how we can um, integrate what school can offer uh, in relation to prevention of multi-generation transmission of trauma. So we talked about children a lot. And I think that the school system can uh, do a great deal of uh, supporting the children by providing a welcoming, supporting, thriving environment and sending the message that it is possible to make the world a safer place for all. Then by receiving support, by receiving encouragement and understanding- yes, but then they go home and mother keeps crying about her mother. Are you, aren't you going then to, to, to worsen the relationship between parents and children? And we know that migrants, it, it's almost a normal, if you read migrant literature, it's normal yeah. to say that children go to the future uh, culture, the parents, you yourself said that. So yeah. how do we do this without uh, creating a further traumatic break? a rupture in the family with, yeah. our, with, with all our good intentions. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and what we see in Croatian schools is that they really try to serve as a safe place for both children and parents. And they can, of course, um, be supporting mechanisms for parents when their own adjustment difficulties prevent them from ensuring that all the children's needs uh, are met. On the other hand, teachers as warm and responsible role models can serve as kind of safe zones to which yes. a child can turn when challenges and difficulties of adjustment seem simply too harsh and overwhelming. These are, these are not questions for us to easily answer, of course. Yeah. These are huge challenges that will involve all the stakeholders that Katrina, you mentioned, and Andre, you mentioned in your presentations, all of you mentioned. But I think these are questions we responsibly have to keep in mind. Yeah. And, and, and try to find the balance between what do we give, what we take away by giving certain things. And I loved the, the sentence, charities don't make it, environments do. God bless you. Thank you, Andre. That was such a wise statement. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, Orest in the comments said, people do. Yes, it is about people. <laughs> we are talking about people. Now, going through the comments and the questions is huge because I'm almost tempted to say, how about planning some webinars where we have an hour for process with, with the audience afterwards uh, because there's such engagement. But so let me try to go through the questions with you to see if we can uh at least consider some of them if not getting into uh, uh into, <laughs> into uh really quote solving them because these are all existential major issues uh so let's not pretend that we can just do a one size fits all one, two, three, four, five, and then we don't have to worry anymore about anything. Uh, so um, Barbara Williams uh, <laughs> is a new friend who is uh, uh, who is aching about our ignorance and lack of attention to, ecolo to the ecology and ecological justice. And, and the refugees of the ecological catastrophes we are facing. She's so such a missionary that she gets even worried when we say some hopeful things because she's afraid it will delude us from the reality of having to face our demise. 
Uh, Barbara, I think the best way to respond to your missionary zeal uh, is to have a webinar, especially on that. But uh, Rabbi, if you give Barbara just one minute to speak, please. Uh, just say, do your thing, but Barbara, I know you're totally gushing. Could you just say it in one or two sentences so all so everyone in the audience will receive it? Rabbi, <laughs> could you let Barbara? Can we? Yes, hear I'm. I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. That's very kind of you, Yael. Um, yes, I have been putting a lot in the in the chat, and um, I I apologise because you folks. No, are, no, don't. It's a about, voice. Yeah, you folks are working so hard, and I'm I'm coming in like a wet blanket, saying, "Look, we've got an ecological collapse that's going on." Yes, um, essentially, I am trying to inspire a culture change which is massive uh, economic degrowth. I want to see global GDP degrowth. And fortunately, thanks to people like Yael and um, the Baha'i, um, there's a lot of work going on the road to the summit, which is um, 2024, I believe. Um, we are going to have in 2024 in the fall in the summit on the future at the UN. That's yes, summit of the future, right. that's right. Um, so. I'm very grateful for, for being given a voice. And I've pasted a link in the chat to my paper, which has recently gone to peer review. It's called, um, it's endorsed by Scientist Warning, and it's called The Roadmap to Ecological Justice. And I'm hoping to inspire a global birth strike, totally voluntary, so that we can minimize the number of children that are exposed to the apocalypse that we have now triggered. And alongside that, once we accept that having children in such a dangerous world is not wise, I'm hoping that the affluent world will see how foolish we are in the way that we spend our money on non-essential consumption. So that's my mission. And thank you very much, Yael, for letting me speak. Okay, you're very welcome, dear. And let's speak separately about having a webinar specifically on that. That'd so be yeah, the can I say one word to Barbara? Many issues. That's a Diane. Um, and, and Aviva is adding another, she's saying, parents often refuse to talk about the trauma. I have been men mentoring refugees in Philadelphia for about 15 years. They also refuse counseling when it is available because it is not part of, quotes their culture. Mm. Anyone wants to mention, I can speak for one second to say, uh, yes, yes, you are absolutely correct. I remember in the group project for Holocaust survivors and their children, that you, we used to call individual therapy, group therapy, community therapy, different kinds of things, but to the community meetings, for, we did the community meetings for exactly for people who would not have anything to do with therapy. It was just, let's just get together Sundays once a month. And, uh, and the parents came when the children insisted that it's not for them, it's for the children. <laughs> And the children can be amazing advocates. Those of you who have children know that. Those of you yeah, who can have I jump with in children to know that too. They can be amazing. So if they can come home and bug the parents sufficiently, they do show up. <laughs> okay, anybody? Yeah, I just wanted to add like one word to what you said in regard to parents are using and unless something from their culture. I do think we all have recently realized that we do need to create a culturally competent approach to counseling and also to many of the intervention that we do. And then also bringing people from those communities uh, who are, are trained or can be trained to involve. Uh, that will be something that of a solution that I can um, send because people sometimes um, like we, but like in, in the African context, mostly we have community-based trauma counseling, 
and he is like individually based. So people mostly like, it's not easy to uh, approach an individual, but it's easy to approach someone through their communities. And then after they, you build confidence and they can come as individuals. So something like that, like I do a lot of mediation in the community. <laughs> so, and for Barbara, she was uh, mentioning early on about hope. I read in her message, um, no matter how, um, difficult uh, that our issues and just the challenges we are confronting, the importance of, 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 of advancing these uh, priorities and issues, we have to educate more people. We don't have to instill fear, rather inspire people to do something positive. Um, we know that is a climate change is a big issue. We know that a crisis, conflict, all of this, we don't have to instill fear on people, but engage more young people, engage people who can be committed and do this. So hope is always the way, I think, for me. Um, as someone from Sudan, if any of you watch the news in Sudan, if it is not for hope, I wouldn't be sitting here talking exactly. to you. Exactly. 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 Uh, we do have some questions in Ukraine. So at some point, I will invite even at Natalia or Anna to, to translate them to us. Uh, uh, Oris, you've been an amazing participant. Would you like to, uh, uh, Rabbi, would you let or please let Oris speak? All right, would you join us, please? We don't hear you. Hello, it's a yes. big pleasure. Thank uh, you, Yale, for inviting me for such work. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for, for giving me a voice. And uh, I post the question in the Q&A section. And I think that... Uh, would be good to know more about the supporting structures, because this is quite good concept in my opinion. So if you give, if you can give a few few examples or some explanation, would be would be thankful. Thank you very much. Well, Andre, you want to speak to it, or you want me as the originator? <laughs> the originator. Go ahead. Well, I actually, supporting structures are very diverse because it's a very complex situation that the refugees face all the time. So that's why it has to be a combination or come from a combination of partners and government to start with to, to put in place the overall infrastructure required. Private sector, private sector, because they also have a role to play. They need workers also. They, they need uh, customers. So it's in their interest as well. Uh, communities have a very important role to play, especially in cases where refugees are like orphans or have lost part of their family. So then the community becomes the family. So it's it's very important that we we have that in mind and we develop techniques uh, to facilitate the insertion of, of the children back in society. So these are just some of the examples of uh, supporting structures that I had in mind. Wonderful. And Oris, may I add, since it's my concept, uh, actually, perhaps the three of us can write a, a paper about that, because I think it is a very useful concept in the sense that people sort of get it without much explanation. Uh, and your question is more important in the sense that you're talking, yes, saying are they formal or informal? They're both, actually and both must be attended to. I remember uh, the, as an NGO working with UNICEF way back when, uh, when the, when the um, Convention of the Rights of the Child came out. Uh, we, we, we made little packages with the convention and penciled and things, and in Mozambique and other countries, we would not I personally, but groups of NGOs would, uh, would take uh, uh, cars and give it to children in school. And children will come and say to the parents, I have rights now. You cannot talk to me like that and show them. The <laughs> it was a wonderful thing. But that led at the time, indeed, to um, 
differentiate between formal leadership and informal leadership in communities. It's a similar question. Where the formal would be governments, ready-made structures, right? But informal, for example, where the gossip of the town, you know, the women who sit and tell people. And that, be, that was a deciding factor in conjunction with uh, no vaccination by the year 2000. Because the women would do the talking, the religious leaders would do the talking, the haircutters, the hairdressers, you know, anywhere where people meet people. And, and it helped us after 9-11 here in New York to assign leaders on the ground. For example, bar pe people in bars, hairdressers, uh, uh, little stores, family stores. They are better conveyors of information than newspapers that people may or may not read. And especially in times of crisis, connection may be broken or whatever. So just open your minds to these issues. But this is a wonderful question that I'm sure this panel can have a third two more panels on. So I'm wondering if there's any other uh, major question. Robbie, there is a question from someone about keeping the chat available to people. Is there a way to do that? Yes, we can put it on the website after. Okay, we so this it. was, uh, and, and uh, Balagaliza Espoir, uh, thanks you, Andre. Um, uh, he is the director, coordinator of Peace World International in the Congo and feels there and gives you the contact. Uh, please be, be in touch and you can be in touch with us anyhow as, as the center. So that would be wonderful for all of you. Uh, is there any other question I'm not seeing? Please, it, everyone can uh, help here. Uh, yeah, that was to Sam Bernard. Um, Let's see, it's not opening for me, the Q&A for some reason. Here it is, yeah. Okay. Uh, I said that the last thing we do is leave last minute, last word. Before we do that, can you think about any of the children you work with? What would they say on this panel? What would they tell us to do for them and for the future and for their own children? What do you envision them telling their children about their experiences as refugees? Or would they keep quiet too? So just take one minute to imagine and I suggest it to all the participants. You're a child now, somebody you met, somebody you know, somebody you're just making up, or just you. Because you've shared your expertise now for a chunk. I would like to hear the children. <laughs> it, it is very true that many, if not most parents, uh, don't like to talk about the trauma they went through, so they tend to hide it in the back of their mind sometimes for all their life, which is really not helping neither them, neither the children. I think uh, we have collectively to uh, to find ways to di diminish this perception of shame that many of the victims uh, still feel. Um, and rather to, to, I would wish my parents, if I was in that situation, would tell me how they felt you know, how it hurt them and then how they overcame that. Um, 
because one learns from that and only if you hear about it and if you're you're taught and your parents are important role models so they have an important role to play in disclosing their feelings and the the ways uh, that they found to overcome them to cry Nimat, what would you what is the child that speaks for you right now says Ah, uh, please unmute. Yeah, what is the question? <laughs> uh, something just diverse. I was reading something on my oh, Just go ahead. Yeah, what was the question? The question was to imagine either a child you met or you as a child in that situation. What would you tell us? What would you tell each one of those people? Yes, well, um, your, what is your dream? Um, as a child, my dream would be to grow up and help um, my families and also my communities and be successful so that I can overcome and make the world a better place. Yeah, I speak to my nieces and nephews a lot. And the good thing is that someone in the family has to be that person who step into everybody's like territory. So I'm that kind of person. I, I'm someone who bridged the gap between like, because I'm just like so outspoken. I think I took this from both like my dad and my mom. Um, so uh, they, I talk to them sometimes like, like we're asking mom, my sister in Cairo for an instance, sometimes like, they, her kids trying to talk to her and she just don't want to talk about any, like a lot of things. And so I talk to them, like I created this friendship with them. So we check on each other. I send them like videos and things and like send them program. So they share a lot with me. And then that way I get their mom to talk. And sometimes she laughs out as like, you just like making me doing things that I don't want with your friends and things like that. So it's kind of, I just um, it's like, if you are able at all, if you are a member of a family or a community and you have that gift of being able to bridge the gap between people or even children in your community, also help other people give ideas. And those of our friends who are professional, I think you have a lot of materials that will help for, for educators and other people. I think many, we need an integrated, as uh, Andrea said, uh, integrated like, you know, support system approach of like having and things evolve. So every day, whenever we discover an issue, especially like I, I usually like, I speak from practical experience because I'm just so much in the community, but also other communities that are not my community. So like Iraqi community or like Syrian community or uh, other communities or like Congolese communities. So um, I like to also compare and ask lots of questions of how people deal with this and what we can do different and things like that. But um, yeah, it's sometimes hard for parents to- In some ways you're saying, uh, it to help the parents understand that it's not only their burden and their shame. Yes. It can be shared with others. And it's absolutely true. Only yesterday in a session, I had a, a totally surprise. Somebody I've worked with for years suddenly remembered her great grandmother was really the shining light. Hmm. And, and and she never mentioned her before. So you you never know when when you open that door what what other supportive people you, you'd find in the. But again, you you find it only when you ask questions and speak and listen, 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 and learn. Katerina, be a child. Yeah, if I would be a child on the ongoing conflict, then first I would I would want to know what my parents are doing to stop a war. Yeah, I just want to feel that somebody's uh, doing something, and my parents especially. And second, it would be good if they would share with me their feelings, how they feel 
what's going on around, you know, and then I would understand that my feelings are good. That's wonderful. So you're talking about integrating before with trauma too. So, so if the trauma ruptures the continuity of life, you're saying, let's unrupture it. Let's repair the rupture. So we talk about the past before. So we don't, so our whole worldview doesn't begin and is built on trauma. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. The children are very smart. Go ahead, Dinka. <laughs> Well, I almost forgot how to be a child. However, I believe that most of children that I've met over the years would say, let me be a child. Mm -hmm. uh, let me be a child, let me play and keep me safe. Uh, I think that these are messages that most of the children uh, would say. And I think that if we are successful in preventing refugee children to develop feelings of social exclusion, of being unwanted, um, and the feeling of being discriminated against, then we do a crucial step for preventing the trauma they have experienced uh, to influence their life long-term and in a toxic way. Thank you. I hope, I hope policymakers are hearing you. I can think of a lot of policymakers who should have heard just that or everything about in, in today's webinar. Absolutely. It's hard to, it's hard to, uh, to stop. I'm, my tendency is let's stay speaking because we have so much wisdom, <laughs> you know, emerging here. Um, there's just one thing I would like to add because, uh, and I think, uh, Nimat, this was the sense of closeness we felt way back. Uh, that that Nimat ends up speaking my language, even though we are in different, uh, in, in different, so many ways, I, right? Uh, background, blah 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 blah. Uh, you know. Those of you who want to 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 pay more attention to studying the field of multi-generational legacies of trauma, our this is what our center is for. And in my old age, I have um, created the in the Danielli inventory for multi-generational legacies of trauma that has three pieces to it, three parts. The first is the child uh, describing the parents and the upbringing. It's called parents' adaptational styles. Those of you who want to understand the concept, listen to that webinar where I was interviewed by, uh, um, come on. You can see it, it's the one before this one. <laughs> the second part is the child resp uh, describing him or herself. Who am I after this? And I call it reparative adaptational impacts. Now, why? Why reparative? Adaptational is because we all have to adapt to what life has to offer us good, bad, and different in this one life we have, little one. But um, why reparative? Because I, in all of my years of study and listening, I've learned that the most profound guiding light for every child survivor or child of survivors is to repair the world for the parents and for themselves. For some, as we know, it becomes a mission. Like you, Nimat, like I. Uh, there's enough missionaries here in this room today <laughs> to fill the world. <laughs> um, 
And actually, in the center, when we gave grants or awards, we call them the repairer awards. It is for people who, who in any field, could be a playwright, could be a, a victim survivor, a, a, such as Suleiman Gwen Graham from Chad, who organized other victims to, to bring to justice. Uh, his, Ken Havre uh, in Chad uh, could be a, a, a woman journalist, uh, a war correspondent who's trying not just to report, but to, to, to bring it to, to repair via the reporting. Okay. Or for people in the injustice who want to create justice instruments. So uh, when each one of you spoke about the children, yes, let's keep them safe. Let's keep them wet. Let's us keep their belief that they are of value and that they can contribute. Even when they feel helpless and even if they feel hopeless. That, yes. And actually, let me add an element to your educational. Uh, how about uh, doing a, 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 a children writing letters to their parents? Child refugees writing letters to the parents. That would be a fantastic contribution if you collect them. Great idea. I'm Great sure idea. some of them will say, Mommy, you can talk to me. It's okay. I want to listen. I'm here. I, I, I don't have enough words to express how thankful I am for this webinar. Uh, we shall continue. I want to announce the upcoming webinars. Uh, we are absolutely diluged deluged by them. Next Monday is International Day for Support of Victims of Torture. We have an amazing, amazing worldwide webinar. Uh, Suleiman is one of the presenters and his son too. <laughs> but we have really, quote, not only live experts, but quotes the experts like us with the PhDs and the MAs and the BAs, etc. Um, on uh, the week after, we have a webinar for about the intergenerational legacies of whistleblowing. Just like that, because I met the missionary way before she was that, she was a missionary for other things, who was an old colleague who became a whistleblower and learned a lot from her experience uh, and created an organization. Uh, we then, July 10th, have a webinar, and this is extremely important and will be interesting not only to you, Andre, but to some of the African colleagues who have joined us in particular, but I think it's true for all of us. Um, uh, you know, many of the Rwandan perpetrators who killed people, murderers, are being released now after the 20 years of prison. We will have a webinar on the impact of prisoners release not only on the families and communities, on, but on the victims, on their children, or the children made born, you know, after, uh, and on the country as a whole. So, uh, and on and on, of course, August, we have, uh, August 9 is International Indigenous Day, uh, even earlier, you know, it's Hiroshima. And we go on and on. But I would like you to, to continue with us and to continue 
the, our dialogues. And I hope you feel as good as I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.